Open your Bibles to Daniel chapter 9, if you would, please. Daniel chapter 9. If you need the notes, hold your hand up. If you only have last week's, you still need this week's, all right? I've revised them a little bit, like I usually do when I've had to cut one short, so make sure you get those. Do a little review from last week and get into the message tonight. A little more teachy than preachy tonight, maybe, but it'll be a help for us. Daniel chapter 9, continuing with, but by prayer, looking at the prayer of confession and revelation. The prayer of confession and revelation. One of the things we need to learn from this is to have a better prayer life. To have our prayer life more fervent, more real, more effective, uh, that we might be the prayer warriors God would have us to be and that we might be a better help for our church, our family, as we learn to pray. And we see in Daniel's prayer of confession and revelation. So in Daniel chapter 9, let's jump down to verse number 20. We'll, by review, we'll look at some of the other verses before that. But when we actually get to the new place, we'll be in verse number 20. He's been praying and he's been confessing. And now in verse number 20 of Daniel chapter 9, And whilst I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem, and the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks, and three score and two weeks. The streets shall be built again, and the wall even in tro troublous times. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off but not for himself, and the people of the prince shall, that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with the flood, and unto the end of the war of desolations be determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many and for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Father, we ask you to help us tonight. Lord, so much in this passage, so much we can understand, and yet so much we don't understand, but we thank you for the fact that we're going to glean tonight some things that will help us in our prayer life, help us in our faith, that will help us in our look to the future. Lord, understanding that you've got the plan, you've got it in place, it's already determined, and we get to fulfill our role. So Lord, I pray that you would stir our hearts to better prayer. You would make us a praying church, which means we're praying Christians, that we know how to pray, and our prayers would be fervent, our prayers would be effective. So God, I think of the next generation we see raising up here, should you tarry. The Lord, they would even be impacted. The teenagers would learn how to pray and make it part of their lives. So Holy Spirit, work with us tonight. Help us tonight. Whatever we need tonight, touch our hearts, even as Gabriel touched Daniel, that we might know you've met with us, and we'll glean from what... This passage teaches to be better for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. All right, again, we're starting out with somewhat of a review from the previous weeks. And I, this is a real danger for me. I like to go back and re-preach it, all right, because I know you've forgotten. I know we meet it again. So, but I'm just going to review to get the running start for maybe some folks that were not here. We're looking at the prayer of confession and revelation. And so we saw, first of all, we saw the order of repentance and revelation. The order of repentance and revelation. There was repentance and then the revelation. We saw that in chapter 8 and in this chapter 9 and in verse number 13. We saw... Uh, that when he repented, then the revelation came. Then the understanding came. And so we need to understand it. Now, by the way, we look at confession and revelation, both dealing with prayer. 
One we don't like, and that's the confession. The other I started to say we do like, but I began to think about it. Maybe we don't like the revelation. Because often, and usually the revelation comes, it's having us to change something in our life. It's something God wants us to do. It's something God's trying to teach us. Because God doesn't teach us things just for head knowledge. God teaches us things for heart knowledge and then to put that truth that He teaches us into practice. And so we find in the case of Daniel, we get the confession and then the repentance. The getting right with God, making sure our hearts are fully open, and then God giving us the revelation. So you say, Preacher, I want to know more. All right, let's make sure our hearts are right with God. So we see the repentance and the revelation. And then we saw last week also the order of obedience and understanding. How the Bible tells us, if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine. So the idea of obeying and then getting the understanding. When God gives a clear instruction, we don't have to understand it, we just have to obey it. But with the obedience then comes the understanding. And so just like a child, we begin to obey, and then we learn from that how that works, and we begin to grow. So let's do a brief review here. Of We saw the first thing in Daniel's prayer, great prayer, a wonderful prayer of confession and revelation. We saw, first of all, the repentant confession. The repentant confession. And as we look at those things, we need to look at the order of the confession also. I think many times we miss having an effective prayer life and an effective confession because we don't follow, if you will, or have the right order of our repentance. Order of our confession. We confess, but we don't always have the right order. Very quickly, just by review, we saw in Daniel's prayer... By the way, this is a prayer of a good man. He wasn't living in sin. He wasn't an alcoholic. He wasn't a drug addict. He wasn't an idolater. Yet we find him confessing his sins and the sins of the people. So no matter how spiritual we think we are, we've got a lot to confess. No matter how far along we think we've come, we've got a lot to confess. And so Daniel here has confessed. We saw, first of all, the setting. The setting of his confession. And that's what he said there. He set himself. He set his face to seek God. So there was a setting, a desire, a desire. He followed that up with a seeking, a seeking. He sought the face of the Lord. So we had the setting. He set himself and then he began to seek God's face. And then we found the sorrow, the sorrow, how he wept and how we find that this godly sorrow that brings repentance. Then we came to the sins and he began laying out the sins. Now, here's our problem. We go right to the sins when it comes time to confess. I mean, if you have on your prayer list confession, I mean, that's where we go. Okay, God, yeah, I shouldn't have done this. Okay, God, I was wrong on this. And God, you showed me something else. But we've not set ourselves to see God's face. We've not set ourselves seeking God's attention. We've not set ourselves so that God's godly sorrow can come. But we're just so quick to check it off. We're just like the, the five-year-old or the six-year-old that says, all right, yeah, I'm sorry I did that. But there is no repentance. There is no sorrow. There is no seeing God's face. There is no seeing the sin for what it is. We just jump right to the sins. But we find Daniel here, a godly man, a good man, yet himself setting himself to look to God, seeking God's face, sorrowing, about his sin, and then confessing his sin. And then we find the summing up, or the sizing up of it at the end, where even after he confessed his sin, remember he said, what belongs to God is righteousness, mercy, and forgiveness. What a blessed thing to belong to our God. I tell you, as I'm, I can't remember when I was preaching about the guy who said his God, I think it was this Sunday, his God was gravity. I'm glad I have a God who... To God belongs righteousness, mercy, and forgiveness. Not just some science, not just some statue, not just some force, but mercy, forgiveness, and righteousness. And then he had to admit that to him, to us, belongs confusion and correction and chastening. And well, we saw that last week. So we find if we're going to have this revelation and our prayer life is going to be what it needs to be we need to have the right kind of confession if we miss confession we're going to miss the power of God if we're going to miss the right kind of confessing our sins and our hearts and getting our hearts right by the way that's what confession is about it's not just us making ourselves feel bad it's not just reminding God what rotten sinners we are the idea of confession is repentance and being right with God 
and having a clear heart with God and a right relationship with God and open channels with God and the peace and power of God in our life. So when we talk about confession, it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing because we're getting right with God that our walk with God might be pure, our walk with God might be holy, our walk with God might be powerful, and we'll have the joy and the confidence we need to walk with God and to do His will. So we find that repentant confession, I could call it a real confession, or a relevant confession. We saw that last week. And then from that confession we find, and where we we'll begin to get where we, just about where we left off, a rapid communique. A rapid communique. And we saw that God's response was quick. By the way, I'm glad God responds. God responds. Sometimes He answers quickly. Sometimes it's later on. But I'm glad God is always right there hearing. He's not... He's not like some of us that checks our email about every third day. Aren't you glad God's always right there to hear? I mean, he, he, you just say, Lord, He says, yes. He's right there. He doesn't turn off his phone. He doesn't... No, he is there. And so we know that his communication is always right. But what's exciting in this passage, as God reveals to us about himself, we find a rapid communique because we saw God's anticipation. God's anticipation. It's based upon his foreknowledge. We see that. Verse number 21 Yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision of the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. And then this is what Gabriel said in verse number 23. Listen, this, this ought to comp, give us confidence in our prayer life. At the beginning of thy supplication, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee. So he said, even as you started praying, even as you started asking God, even as you went, he said, God told me to go. Even at that moment, even if you just get started because God knew what the prayer was going to be. Aren't you glad God knows what's going to happen? I think in our Christian school, God knew that the first place was going to fall through. He knew that. And so we just have confidence. All right, God, you must have another plan. You must have another place. Guide me and direct me. But God deals from foreknowledge. He doesn't say, I think this will probably happen if I do this. He doesn't have to say, well, I wonder if I do this. If this, he, No, he goes operates based on the foreknowledge. The Bible talks often about the foreknowledge of God. And I mentioned that with Philip and the eunuch. We talk about our salvation, the idea of being the elect. 1 Peter 1, 2, we're the elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. So he knows who's going to receive him. He, that's why you can say, whosoever will may come. For whosoever shall call upon the Lord shall be saved. He's got the whosoever, but God knows who the whosoevers are, and so he refers to them as the elect. So we find that God's communication, God's rapid communication with Daniel, was based and reminds us about God's anticipation based upon based upon foreknowledge. Then we find not just God's anticipation, and now we're about to where we ended up last week, we find God's angel. God's angel, Gabriel. Gabriel is an angel sent by God to Zach Zacharias to announce the birth of John the Baptist. He came to Mary to, for about the birth of Christ and out to Daniel to explain his visions. Three times he's mentioned. So we think about the angels. Angels meaning messengers. When we think about that, you can just write it down in Revelation uh, chapter... I didn't write it down. Revelation chapter 1, I think the last verse of Revelation chapter 1, it explains that the angels of the churches that is written to in Revelation are the pastors. That's what it is. It is the pastors. It's the messengers to the church. You're looking at... An angel, aren't you glad? Oh, I'm glad somebody, bless your heart, you're going to do that. Somebody said, yeah, but Satan's an angel too. Yeah, I know. I'll beat you to that one. All right, but, so it's the angel, it's a messenger. So we find God's angel here uh, coming. So God's angel, God's messenger. Then in verse number 22, we find God's anointing. And here we're slowing down. This is where we find. So in his rapid communique, he came based upon his answer, based upon his anticipation, the foreknowledge of God. He knew what was going to happen. He sent his messenger, his angel. But we find God's anointing in his response. Notice in verse 22. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am, come for, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. 
He said, I got something to give to you. God has sent me in response to your prayer, in response to your supplication, to give you skill and understanding. We need the anointing of God, skill and understanding in our ministries, in our parenting, and in every work we do for God. We need skill and understanding. We need to, See, he said, I came here to give it to you. In other words, he said, Daniel, you don't have it unless I give it to you. You don't have it unless God gives it to you. You don't have it like you ought to have. You don't have it like you need to have. And that's why God sent me to give it to you. A special anointing. Daniel was a wise man. Daniel was a smart man. He was very intelligent. We could go back and look at the things we studied earlier. But the idea is, he's very wise, he's very smart. But he said, God's got something special. You need this skill and understanding. We need God's skill and understanding. We need God's gifts. We need God's power. We need God's anointing. You say, preacher, what does that come, where does that come from? The Holy Spirit. That comes from the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 2.13 and it says, which things also we speak, not in the words with man's wisdom teaches. Aren't you glad we got something besides man's wisdom? Aren't you glad we got something besides college's wisdom? Aren't you glad we got something besides political wisdom? We don't have, we got something beyond the wisdom of man, which is not wisdom. Which things we also also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So it's vital that we have the Holy Spirit in our lives to give us that understanding, to give us that teaching, to give us that skill and understanding, to communicate what God wants us to communicate, and to know what God wants us to know. Where does it come from, class? The Holy Spirit. Where does it come from? The Holy Spirit teaches us those things. The things, the Spirit of man teaches us the Spirit of man. I mean, we can understand humanity. We can understand man's thinking and carnal thinking. We've got that because we're the Spirit of man. That's why a lost man can talk about finances. That's why a lost man can talk about the things of the world. But to understand the things of God, to understand the, understand the things of Christ and the spiritual aspects of the world, we have to have that Holy Spirit. That's why it's important we do not grieve the Holy Spirit. And we don't quench the Holy Spirit. By living in sin, we quench and grieve the Holy Spirit and we're not able to hear our teacher communicate to us. So we find God's anointing. He gives that skill and understanding. But again, this comes after the confession. This comes after getting right. God knowing the desire, not knowing the thought, He sent Him. He said, yeah, I'm here to give you that skill and understanding. So in our prayer life, it wouldn't be wrong to ask God to give you the understanding. It wouldn't be wrong to say, Holy Spirit, give me the understanding. Teach me what man can't teach me. What my mind can't do it by itself. Give me that understanding. And so we find Daniel who did not understand. Remember, he had had the visions, but it made him even sick because he said, I just can't understand. He said, I see it, and it's been tried to explain to me. He says, but I just can't get it. And so now God, in prayer, in response to Daniel's prayer of confessing, he said, I must not be getting it because there's sin of Israel. And as he prayed and he confessed, God sent the answer. So we need that anointing. You pray for me. I'll pray for you that we have the anointing of the Holy Spirit on our lives for skill and understanding. Not for mumbling in some unknown language and some mumbo jumbo, that we can have the anointing of God to understand God's Word and communicate that effectively to other people and to follow God's instruction. So we've got God's anointing, the giving of skill and understanding. And then we have God's affection. In His communication, in His communique, in His response to a godly man's prayer of confession, a godly man's repentance, we find part of God's response is God's affection. Look at verse 23. At the beginning of thy supplication, the commandment came forth. So you started to pray, the commandment came. He said, I got the word from God to go. And I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. What a wonderful thought. He said, you are greatly beloved. Therefore, Understand the matter and consider the vision. Greatly beloved. Greatly beloved. 
The word beloved is used 113 times in the Bible. Sometimes talking about people, sometimes talking to people, sometimes God talking, but beloved. Beloved. Not just, but beloved. Song of Solomon 2.16 My beloved is mine and I am his. He feedeth among the lilies. That idea of beloved. He said you are greatly beloved. Aren't you glad God loves us? Aren't you glad we talk about ourselves being the beloved? And as, as even as God to us through the, through the apostles' writing talks about dearly beloved. Beloved. I'm glad I'm loved. And here's the interesting thing that Daniel's getting this revelation. He says thou art he says, far because. He said, I came to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. And thinking about Daniel being one of the greatly beloved. Again, God loves us all. And God's not a respecter of persons. But many times I've had to remind us, God can, ma can only manifest His love to us based upon many times our own heart and our own actions. He loves us the same. But based upon our love, He can manifest that love in different ways. He can manifest that love. Here He says, you are greatly beloved. And I begin thinking about Daniel being the greatly beloved. So let, me, let us learn tonight. God loves us. But let's look at Daniel's life very briefly on how we might also be that greatly beloved. That God can manifest that love in the same way. We see, first of all, the character of this beloved. The character of this great beloved. I'm sorry, let's back up. The condition of this great beloved. The condition of this great beloved. He said, you're greatly beloved. Listen up, class. Where was Daniel? In captivity. We just saw just over in chapter, the beginning of chapter uh, 9, he's just now understanding we're at the end of the trip. We're at the end of this captivity. We're at the end. He said, I studied the books of Jeremiah and the preaching of Jeremiah. And from that I learned, wow, I know why we're in captivity. I know why we've been taken captive. I know why my parents were probably killed and I was drug in as a slave. He said, we're nearing the end of that. So he was in captivity. He's in captivity as a slave and yet he is greatly beloved. Don't think God doesn't love you because you're in captivity. Don't think God doesn't love you because you got some trials. Don't think God doesn't say, that's my dearly beloved. See, we got the idea, if I'm dearly beloved, then everything's going to be smooth. If I'm dearly beloved, I won't have any financial problems. If I'm dearly beloved, all my health is going to be great. That's not Bible. I don't care what Joel, whoever he is, says. It's dearly beloved. He said, you are greatly beloved. You've been a slave. You're dearly beloved, but you were taken captive. Probably your parents were killed. Dearly beloved, and you were put in a lion's den. Are you out there? He said, you are dearly beloved, but you had to go through some trials. So don't think just because you've got tragedy in your life. Don't think just because you lost a job. Don't think because you've got some health issues going on in your life. Don't think because your life seems to be falling apart that you are not still dearly beloved. Oh, he had Daniel in a place and in circumstances that he needed. So we find the condition of this dearly beloved was captivity. Secondly, we see the character of this dearly beloved, even in that condition. By the way, we need to have the right character regardless of the condition we're in. Regardless of the trials, regardless of whether you're in jail or whether you're in the, in the penthouse, we've got to have that same character. And so let's find this character of this beloved. When we think of Daniel's character, at least I always think of two things. I think of purity and prayer. Purity in prayer. We're studying his prayer. He's a great man of prayer, but he was also a man of purity. Of purity. It's one thing to think yourself pure. It's another thing to act yourself pure. We look at his purity. First of all, I'll mention the positions, his positions of purity. His positions of purity. We won't take the time because it's already getting late. But the position of his purity. In other words, he knew his position in the area of purity. He knew it. Remember back in, in the first part of Daniel, when he was taken captive, he says he, was, he had purposed in his heart he would not defile himself with the king's meat. He knew his position. He said, I'm not going to do it. I know where the line is. I know where the boundary is. I've made up my mind he said, no, this is not right. That, I'm not going to cross that line. I will not defile myself with the king's meat or his wine. I will not do it. I've been taught it's God's commandment for me. It's my instruction. I will not do it. He knew his position in purity. He drew the line. 
He had what we might call today standards. He had some standards in his life and said, I'm not going to cross that line. So we have to ask ourselves, do I know where my position in purity is? We often will talk about it, but do we have the line? Do we have that barrier? Say, no, I will not cross it. I know my position. Or we say, I know what my position should be. Or we say, no, it's that position. We've talked about it before, about our, about our standards in our life. We know the sin. The sin line is probably not the best place to draw your standard. Because you don't want a little slip in a your position to put you in the sin. Example we use. You don't, you don't want your child, you don't want your four-year-old playing in the street. So you don't tell your four-year-old, okay, see where, the, see where the concrete starts? And where the cars go by? That's your limit. No, you don't let your four-year-old go and stand at the edge of the highway. Hello. You usually say, you stay on this side of the ditch. Or better yet, we'll put, we'll put a fence up and have you over here. Why? Because we don't want you to get hurt over there. And so we sometimes have our standards for our lives to keep us from falling into sin. Don't look at me like that. That's exactly what we do with the kids. But Daniel had a position of purity. He said, I'm not going to cross that line. I'm not going to go there. I will not eat that meat. So in his character of this greatly beloved, we find he knew where his standards were. We need to have our line of standards where our purity is, where we say, I will not cross that. I will not listen to that. I will not watch that. I will not participate in that. I will not go there because we need to know our position of purity. Okay, that's his character. We look at Daniel. If Daniel had given in back then, if he said, well, I'm a, after all, I'm a slave. After all, my parents probably were killed and I'm here. As a, he said, I'll just go ahead and go with the flow. After all, everybody else here eats that. Everybody else is doing that. I don't want to cause a ruckus. That would be a bad testimony if people thought I was a troublemaker. But he said, no, God has given me instructions. And so his position. Boy, you're looking at me strangely tonight. Because we live in a society that doesn't want positions of purity. So he got the position of purity. He knew where he drew the line. Number two, we find his passions for purity. His passion for purity. In other words, he was willing to pay the price. He was willing to pay the price. He said, I will not defile myself. Now, he wasn't a pain about it. He did go up to the eunuch, the guy in charge of him, and says, let's talk. Let's talk. Let's see if we can avoid this. He said, I, I, I can't eat the meat. It's just, it, it goes against my principles. It goes against my God. It goes against who I am and what God is doing in my heart. He said, I just can't. And you know the story how the eunuch said, but I don't want to lose my life over this. He said, well, let's make a deal. By the way, let me help you. Sir. You'd be surprised how God can work in the hearts of other people to let you do right. You'd be surprised. I know, for example... Like for our girls, uh, our girls were not allowed to wear pants. They just were not allowed to do that. Because, and we'll, by the way, we'll talk about that another time. But that was just not something they did. We, we did not allow our girls to wear pants. And so they said, well, they're going to work at this fast food. You'd be surprised that fast food restaurants do have dresses. At least they did. In their uniform, just nobody wore them. And when they said, you know, we would, they'd say, okay, we can work around that. Daniel went to the king, to king's eunuch and says, I can't eat the meat. He said, let's work around that. But if the king's servant had said, no, Daniel wouldn't have eaten the meat. I'm convinced of that. Boy, it's real quiet in here. Smile at me tonight. Well, yeah, all right, good, good. He had his passions for his period. He said, well, I want to be beloved. Daniel was a wonderful man of being beloved, but he had some character about his purity. He had some passions for it. In his prayer life, he said, I'm not going to give up my prayer life. He said, my prayer life is vital to me. My prayer life is part of my purity as I pray to God. And he opened up the windows, even though it meant him being thrown in the lion's den, which meant it may have cost him his life. But he said, I've got that passions for purity. That's his character. You look at Daniel. Daniel had character about his purity. He had a passion for his purity. He was not going to give in. He was willing to pay the price. Then very quickly, his perfection. Not just his purity, but his perfection. His perfection. We find he was a man of character. We find there, and it says in Daniel chapter 6, verse number 4, remember that they got jealous over him because he was placed in a top position. 
And the presidents and the princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. They said, we're going to find some, we're going to dig up some dirt on this guy. By the way, most of us don't, most people don't have to dig very deep to find dirt on most of us. They said, we're going to find some dirt on this guy. We're going to dig. We're going to find something about him regarding his job, regarding the king. We'll find some, we're going to find some email where he complained about the king. We're going to find some meeting where he met with somebody who's not the king's friend. We're going to find something. They were going to find some dirt on this guy. But they could, they could find none occasion nor fault. For as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. So we find in his character, we see his purity and his perfection. They said the only way we're going to find fault with this guy is when he follows God instead of the king. So in his workplace, in the world, he had good reputation, good character. In other words, he was honest, his effort was right, his dedication was right in the world. Wow. Greatly beloved. God loves us all. But here he referred to him as greatly beloved. And again, he was able to manifest that love because of this man we see of his character. Now, the condition was, he was in captivity. But he still had the character. He still had the love of God. He still had the passion for his purity. He still had the perfection. He still did what was right. So we find in his prayer life, this but by prayers we're looking at, this prayer of confession and revelation, we find repentant confession, rapid Communicate, God responded. Now, at the end of that, we find a revealed conclusion. A revealed conclusion. And this is where most folks get excited. They like revelation. They like looking at the end and trying to figure out what's happening. But God then revealed some new stuff to him. After he confessed, after he got right with God, after his heart was open and receptive, he said, I'm going to give you the skill and understanding. Consider this vision. He revealed the conclusion. Aren't you glad God knows what's going to happen? God knows what's going to happen. So tonight in this last little portion, it's not going to be so much a lesson, but an explanation about the 70 weeks and about the end time. We'll have to come back when I preach through Revelation again or through Daniel, those, but we're looking at it. So let's look at the endings. The endings. He revealed the endings to him. He showed him what the end was going to look like. You know, this is, we're just closer to the end than Daniel was, but we've got the same end. So if you look, if you would, the endings. Verse 24. Of Daniel chapter 9. Are you with me tonight? Oh, I hope so. Here we are looking at the end. God reveals the end to him. It says, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy to anoint the Most High. Now, we see the endings. These endings, this portion we just read, could be referring to either the future in general or all about heaven. Two areas, and we'll look at that. That little list he gave, he said he saw ahead in the 70 weeks, it was either the future in general, basically taking us to the cross, or all about heaven. Either the cross or heaven in that passage we just read. Maybe both. But let's notice what it says. Cross or heaven, and you can look at it, it can fall to both. And you decide which one that God's speaking to your heart about tonight. So we'll talk about the 70 weeks in a second, but looking ahead. Because many times when God talks about the last days, the kingdom of heaven, He's either talking about way in the future or at the rapture. It's, because from us, it's the kingdom of God. It's coming ahead. It's in the last days. Whether it's the last days tomorrow or the last days a thousand years from now, it's the last days. And so God sometimes refers to the rapture or even beyond as the last days. And you have to understand that. So Daniel here is looking at the last days. And he gives him in these 70 weeks, looking ahead into the future, because the end of the 70 weeks is the end times. And so we're finding, notice what he said. This is what he saw. To finish the transgression and to make an end of sins. That happened at the cross. To finish the transgression, to make an end of sins. Aren't you glad the payment for sin was taken care of on the cross? 
Oh, what a wonderful thing. He's looking ahead. He said, listen, at the end times, looking ahead of these 70 weeks, he said, looking ahead to this future, there's going to be an end of sin, an end of transgression. We're going to finish the transgression and make an end of sin. The judgment on sin, the punishment of sin, victory over sin. Amen. The Bible says we don't have to sin anymore. We don't have to give in to sin anymore because this old man was crucified on the cross. So it could be the cross. Or it could be just heaven. Aren't you glad in heaven it's the end of sin? Aren't you glad at the end of heaven there's no more sin? In heaven there's no more transgression? It's the finish. It's over. And if you want to just write it down, Revelation 21.4 and Revelation 22.3, all the no mores, no more iniquity, no more sin. Boy, in heaven there's not going to be any more sin. It's the end of transgression. It's the end of sin. It's all over. But also at the cross, which we'll see, he's going to talk about it in a second, at the cross of Calvary was the end of sin and the end of transgression. But he sees ahead the end. Whether it be the cross, whether it be in heaven, I see it in both places. He goes on in his list. To make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness. So to make reconciliation, to make payment for iniquity, to make payment for sin, that reconciliation. On the cross, there was reconciliation for iniquity. In other words, sin was paid for. Reconcile all the sin, all the wickedness, all the bad intent. We talked about what iniquity was. It's in the heart. It's the attitude. He said that reconciliation, reconciling because of iniquity, was done on the cross of Calvary. But also in heaven at the same time, it'll be worth it all. Amen? All the iniquity, all the problems, all the sufferings we go through here, it'll be reconciled in heaven. We sing the song, it'll be worth it all. So he said, look, Daniel. He said, looking toward the end, he said, I got some good news for you. You're a captive and you're enslaved. But he said, you look ahead. We see the ending. We see either the cross or heaven, the finish of transgression, the end of sin, reconciliation for inequity. No else what he says. And to bring in everlasting righteousness. Oh, I'm glad we have at the cross the righteousness of Jesus Christ on our account forever. Everlasting righteousness. Or in heaven, it's all everlasting righteousness. No sin, no immoralities, no sin. Woo! Daniel said, look ahead. You've got some things coming ahead. The ending. Then it says, to seal up the vision and prophecy. In other words, finish it up. Close it off. Boy, the cross closed up the prophecy of the coming Lamb. He closed it up. There it was. Jesus said, it is almost finished. No, he says, what? It's finished. He said, we close up. All those things, all the Lamb of God, all that pointing to the cross, it closed up the prophecy, it closed up the vision. Or, we look all the way to heaven and it's really all done. All prophecy, all visions, it's closed up, it's done. Close the book. Take, read the last page, last page of the book. Close it up, it's done. Oh, Daniel, look ahead. So he revealed the conclusion of this whole time. So we find the reconciliation for iniquity. We find the bringing in of everlasting. We find the seal up, the vision, and the prophecy. And then I love this next part also, to anoint the most holy. Whoa, the King of kings and Lord of lords. That's what was posted there on the cross, and that's what we see Jesus at the Battle of Armageddon coming, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Oh, what a wonderful place heaven is. When he's looking ahead, whether he sees just the cross or sees all the way in the end, I'm not sure, but it looks like both to me as he looks forward to what's happening. We find that anointing the most holy of God. So we have the ending, and then we see the evil. The evil. Verse number 25, and then we'll look at the, the 70 weeks in a brief overview, and we'll be done. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore, to build Jerusalem, to Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks, and three score and two weeks. Talk to me, class, what's three score? Sixty and two, so that's sixty-two. The street shall be built again in the wall even in troublous times, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. Remember that, and we'll just briefly touch on it. But not for himself. And the people of the prince shall come, and shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with the flood, and under the end of the war desolations be determined. And he shall confirm the covenant, and we'll talk very briefly about this, so hang, read with me. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. 
And in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations she shall make it desolate, even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. What we have here is a picture of the end times coming, the 70 weeks of Daniel. Now again, this is more of an explanation than a lesson on it, but let's understand what he's saying. He said he sees the 70 weeks. Each week is actually a week of years. So when you have a week, it's seven years. Okay? Seven years. So the 70 weeks of Daniel is really a long, long time. You mathematicians can figure that out, all right? So we're talking, four, what was that? 490 years. All right, so you've got it in your notes. Let's see the next slide that breaks down the 70 weeks. And so notice he says where the 70 weeks starts is when the call to restore Jerusalem and rebuild the walls. Where in Ezra, he said, okay, the king says, let's go rebuild the walls. He said, that's where the 70 weeks starts. Now, he's, he's at the end of the 70 year captivity now. So he's looking back and said, all right, we've got the word to go. So at the call to restore Jerusalem, that's where the 70 weeks begins. And we have then seven weeks at that point, and then 62 weeks. So look again, verse 50, where was it? Verse 26, or verse 25. Knowing therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore, to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, to Jesus Christ, shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. So, threescore and two weeks and seven weeks. How many weeks? Sixty-nine weeks. Okay, so we have sixty-nine weeks from the word to go out to restore Jerusalem. When he sends Ezra, he said, okay, go and rebuild the walls and rebuild the temple until the Messiah. That's 69 weeks. Notice in verse 26, and after three score and two weeks, so we got the seven weeks of rebuilding the temple, rebuilding Jerusalem, and then the 60 and two weeks, and after the three score and two weeks shall Messiah, Jesus Christ, be cut off. What do you think Messiah being cut off means? Crucifixion. Messiah is cut off. He's dead. He's crucified. So we've got at the end of the 62 or the 69 weeks, we've got the 7 weeks, then the 62, which gives us the 69, shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. Aren't you glad he wasn't cut off for himself? He was cut off for us. He was crucified for us. And so we've got that, and then the cross. Then we have what we call the church age. There's a break. We are waiting for the 70th week. There is a break here. We're still waiting for that last week. Week meaning seven years. The tribulation. We're in a break time right now between the cutting off the Messiah and the beginning of the 70th week. Again, we'll come back sometime and study that with all the verses, but that's so we have the church age. Right now, we're waiting for the 70th week to begin. So we're here after the cutting off the Messiah, we're waiting. We're in the age of grace, if you will. We're in the church age, waiting for that last week. And so it's, since the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we're in a pause. There's a pause between the 69 weeks and the 70th week, which is the week of the tribulation. And right now we have the, what we're experiencing, the grace of God, the patience of God, waiting on God, waiting on Him to bring that last week. People are being saved. We've got the church age. The last week, the 70th week, begins with the rapture of the church. That's when it begins, when the tribulation begins. That last week, and he talks about that here and in Revelation. And so we have the rapture, and that begins the 70th week, or the time of the tribulation. Seven years of the tribulation. And he speaks in that. He said the, the Antichrist, and I think I've got the verse in there for you. If not, write it down. 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 3 through 7. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 through 7. The Antichrist makes a deal with the Jews and makes the Jews very happy. And they rebuild the temple and start the oblations again. They start the evening sacrifices. They do all that. So he makes a big deal with them. But at the middle of the week, halfway through the week, in other words, three and a half years into the tribulation, he sets himself up inside as God. He stops it. He makes himself as God. He makes himself as the one to worship. And he stops the abominations. And then the next three and a half years of the tribulation becomes real bloody and bad. So we have... The 70th year, the week of the tribulation, and halfway through is, as he mentions here, the abomination of desolation. What Jesus said in Matthew 24 about the abomination of desolation, it's when the Antichrist comes in and says, enough. I said, I know we made a deal, but I'm breaking the deal. I know we had a deal, but Jews, guess what? He says, oh, we're not going. And the Jews then rebel against him as he sets himself up as God inside the temple that's been rebuilt. And then we've got the last part. And then we have the return of Christ at the end of the tribulation, 
where he comes back and we come back with him, the battle of Armageddon and the millennial reign begins. So when you read about this week of 70 weeks, he said, Daniel, let me show you the end. He says, you got seven weeks starting with the return to go to Jerusalem to rebuild it. He said, then at the, at the end of that, we got 60 and two weeks till the Messiah is cut off. But not for himself, but for us. He says, and then we got the 70th week coming up, but there is that break, the 70th week, where the wicked one, the prince of the people, will set himself up, make a deal with the Jews, and halfway through that week, in other words, three and a half years into the seven years, the desolation will come, the abomination will come, and will go. So when people talk about the 70th week, that we're still waiting for the 70th week to start. The 70th week starts when the rapture occurs and the tribulation begins. So he looked ahead and he showed him the end. Aren't you glad God's in control? Amen. Oh my, so much. But the Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself. Then for who? For us. For us. So tonight if we look at Daniel's prayer, but by prayer, an amazing prayer of confession. Again, he started confess confessing because he says, I don't understand. I don't understand what you're trying to show me, God. Make my heart right so I can understand. And as he began to pray and confessed his sins and the sins of the people, and his heart got, as soon as he started confessing, God said, all right, Gabriel, go and give him the skill and knowledge he needs to consider this vision I'm getting ready to show him. He said, look ahead, 70 weeks. All the way to the end. So, how's our prayer life? Are we getting any revelations? By the way, you're not going to get something new that's contrary to the Bible. But God will reveal some Bible stuff to you. God will reveal some direction to you when our hearts are right. How's our prayer life? How's our obedience for understanding? How's our joy on being the beloved? And how's the peace we have as we look forward? The day's coming. The rapture could occur tonight. That last week could start tonight. Let's be living for Him. Let's be living so that all may know. Let's bow our heads, please.